was little uh, because I've always been a programmer. Like, like I said, since I was very, very young, I always wanted to program. And in those days, there was really no internet and no communication with anybody. So I didn't know any game developers and I didn't know anything about game developers, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just had computers that I could program at home and I tried to learn to program them and make games on them as best I could and that was really all I had to go on. And <clears throat> um, my father, who was a programmer, was not a game programmer. He worked on traditional like um, uh, tools for uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, which is a now defunct hardware company, right? Uh, and so most of the things that I might have wanted to know, he didn't necessarily know. Like he didn't know hardly any 3D math or anything like that um, that you would use for game development because it's just not that's not common knowledge uh, among programmers, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that was really exciting for me as a young programmer was when I was still in high school, um, I had met over the uh, a previous summer. Um, some programmers from Microsoft, and they were going to Looking Glass, which is a company that, uh, again, doesn't exist today, but they made a bunch of games that a lot of people um, consider seminal, like Ultima Underworld, and System Shock, and Thief the Dark Project, and Flight Unlimited. Just a lot of very important games in yeah. the pantheon of games when people are talking about history. Um, they were going there to port uh, Flight Unlimited to Windows, because this was at the very early time when Windows didn't really run real-time games for the most part, mm -hmm. um, because it didn't have a way of, of actually writing graphics to a back buffer like you would in DOS, yeah. um, and so they were going to go do that, and they asked me if I wanted to come, and my mom let me take uh, a few days off from school, so instead of going to school, I went into Cambridge. Uh, and I like got to go work on the Windows port of Flight Unlimited, and it's the first time I'd ever really set foot in a game company. And uh, I think about that time often these days, uh, especially because as you get older, you definitely become uh, more sort of cynical about everything, about development, about companies, about everything. You know everything you do and it's easy to lose sight of what you love about things or what was important to you but I think back about those, those days now and like it was like the most magical experience I imagine it was probably similar to if as a, a you know a lot of children grow up maybe dreaming of playing in the NBA or something and it's like you know some of those children probably get to randomly get to go out and shoot a free throw uh, you know, with their favorite team, you know, or, or something like this. And it was exactly that experience for me. Uh, you know, just even seeing what it looked like to walk into a game development studio and see what the people there were doing and, like, meet the people behind it. And I remember literally, like, everything about that experience. Like, I remember we went to a grocery store next door called Bread and Circus, and we bought, like, some bread and cheese and apples and stuff and brought them back and like ate them around a lunch table. Things that are inconsequential, I'm sure, to everyone else who worked there still like stick in my memory as like, I don't know if you can call it a formative experience because that's a sort of different thing, I suppose, but it's definitely like, it just shows me how much of an innate draw towards this I had and I expect that other people who, you know, if if you want to know whether this is the kind of thing you might want to be doing with your life, if that's kind of the way you feel about it, if you have those kinds of feelings, then you're probably right. Um, <laughs> but if you don't, maybe not, right? I mean, it's a hard job. Uh, it's not like playing games. It has nothing to do with that. And so, um, I feel like you have to, to almost approach it from that same thing, and, and maybe the NBA example is pretty good. If you like watching people play basketball, that's not the same as liking playing basketball, and it's good to know which of the two you want to do, because if you just like watching basketball, 
then there's no harm in having an ancillary job. You could work on the communications team for your favorite sports team, just like you might work in the production department of your favorite game company. But engine programmer is the on the court job um, that's really demanding and demands the kind of dedication, I think, in a lot of ways that an athlete has to have. You're expected to know a lot more. You're expected to work a lot harder. You're expected to know such a, to have trained your brain in such a demanding way at some level that um, I think you kind of have to have a certain love for it to really want to do it. And, and to get back to maybe one of the questions you asked me earlier, that might be why I think it's so important to try and expose more people to it. Because I think there's a very limited number of people who really have the desire to do it. And finding those people is important to me. And I think that it's worth doing. And there's so many other jobs out there for a programmer to have that are not as hard as this and that aren't as demanding as this that I think that there's plenty of other jobs for people to go to. And I think they will go to them if their heart's not really in it. So finding out if your heart is in it is good. Uh, and, and, and I would encourage people to do that as early as possible.